My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. On the 19th of March, 1945, Adolf Hitler issues one of the most chilling orders of his entire regime. Demolitions on Reich territory authorized all German units to destroy everything that could provide any assistance to the approaching enemy. Bridges, roads, all industrial and factory infrastructure. Thankfully, most German commanders ignored that order, uh, or else it would have condemned Germany to total devastation. And that appears to have been the point. The day before the order, Hitler told Albert Speer that if the war is lost, the, the German people are lost. The idea of the Volksdeutsche was lost. By being defeated, the German Volk had shown itself to be the weaker nation. It actually deserved to be destroyed. You could say that Hitler was lost in his own personal Wagnerian opera. He, he, he was plunging Germany into the twilight of the gods. It's a total act of narcissism. If Hitler fails, then the nation, the people, they have failed him and they must fall with him. This was one last conflagration, one last act that results in the destruction of everything. And Hitler is not alone. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the Japanese high command is absolutely intent on fighting to the bitter end, no matter what the cost might be. It would take an act of Wagnerian proportions to get them to snap out of that line of thinking. Even in defeat, the men who caused this war are preparing to sacrifice their own people in apocalyptic numbers. July and the 3rd of August 1943, more than 2,300 Allied bombers turned the German industrial city of Hamburg into an inferno. In every way, Operation Gomorrah brings the totality of modern strategic bombing to the city of Hamburg, mainly because of the use of incendiary weapons. In just four raids, the Allies dropped something like 9,000 tons of bombs, 45,000 people were killed, three quarters of the city was destroyed, something like a million people were left homeless. 45,000 people dead, that's more than were killed during the entire Blitz. After Operation Gomorrah, Albert Speer turned to Adolf Hitler and told him, if there are six more of these, we're done. Fortunately for the Nazis, the British didn't have the capacity to mount many more of these raids in 1943. What turned the tide was a new kind of plane introduced by the Allies in 1944. This wasn't a bomber, it was a fighter, the P-51 Mustang. I think the most important contribution made by the Allied bomber offensive was the long-range Mustang escort fighter, which proved able to outfight any German fighter in the air over Germany. It's powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which makes it a superior performer. It's armed with six ANM-2 50 caliber machine guns, which provides a lot of muscle for the aircraft for strafing missions and then also for aerial intercept. But crucially, it could be equipped with long-range fuel tanks, it could be jettisoned when empty, and these increased its range to something like 1,600 miles. This meant that they could escort Allied bombers all the way to Germany and back. More than 15,000 P-51 Mustangs were produced by the end of the war. Allied bomber losses fell from almost 10% to a mere 3.5%. 
The Allied bombing campaign could now rain down hell on German cities. In the last 12 months of the war, the Allies dropped something like 30 to 40 times as many bombs on German targets as the total tonnage of bombs dropped by the Germans in the Blitz. Cities like Dresden, Essen, Cologne, Bremen and Berlin are targeted again and again by up to a thousand bombers with a terrible toll on civilian life. They realized that what they had to find was a, was a series of vulnerable targets and they chose communications, they chose chemicals, they cho chose synthetic oil and they focused all their effort on those targets. These are important strategic centers for bombing. But at the same time, there are also areas where enormous numbers of civilians live. So by attacking these areas, and in some cases obliterating these areas, is it right to kill enormous numbers of civilians when you are also targeting Germany's ability to fight the war? In 1945, an Allied post-war study of the bombing campaign concludes that less than 17% of Germany's industrial capacity had been affected by the bombs. Albert Speer would not have agreed. He concludes that as a result of Allied bombing, there are 35% fewer tanks, 31% fewer airplanes, and 42% fewer trucks available to the German military. Perhaps most importantly, a third of all artillery production had to be given over to anti-aircraft guns. Three quarters of the flak 88 millimeter guns that Germany had had been pulled back into Germany to defend the airspace. So they weren't able to participate in the fighting in the east. They weren't able to oppose allied forces in Normandy. And that was the most effective general purpose weapon that Germany had. The critical thing came in 1944 with the switch in 8th Air Force, American 8th Air Force strategy, where they focused all their effort to starve the German armed forces of oil and to disrupt communications to such an extent that it was no longer possible for the German war economy to function effectively. From that point on, the bombing campaign had a profound effect on the German war effort, as Albert Speer grimly confirmed to his Fuhrer. This is a man who had increased production threefold between 1941, when he took over, and 1943. And he has concluded that Germany has lost the war of industry as a result of Allied bombing. They did so at a cost of over 600,000 civilian lives. Whether that terrible civilian death toll made it all worthwhile, that's something everybody must judge for themselves. This is the last thing Adolf Hitler wants to hear in January 1945. Because just one month earlier, he'd staked everything he had on one last throw of the dice, which, if it succeeded, would turn the war on its head. 16th of December, 1944. Allied forces are racing across Europe towards the Rhine. They're quite strung out, but Allied High Command isn't particularly concerned because there isn't a great enemy presence in the area. Allied intelligence is wrong. Hiding in the forest of the Ardennes are 17 German divisions, including five panzer divisions, something in the region of 240,000 men. Some of these contain the new Tiger II heavy panzer. This is the Tiger II, the so-called King Tiger or Royal Tiger. It's got frontal armor of 185 millimeters. That's seven inches. And that gun, it's the long 88. And it means that if that tank can see you on the battlefield, there is nothing the Allies have that can resist one of those rounds. Hitler wants these in large numbers, but they're difficult and slow to manufacture. On the morning of the 16th of December, this scratch force launches a surprise attack upon six weak American divisions, containing 83,000 men recuperating in the Ardennes Gap. The initial German advance creates a bulge in the Allied line 40 miles deep, which gives the battle its name, the Battle of the Bulge. At the outset of the battle, the Germans appear well on their way to Antwerp. But then things begin changing right around Christmas. The crucial weakness in the German plan is fuel. This tank is a gas guzzler. 
fully fueled up, it could travel about 75 miles. But to refuel took 860 litres of fuel, that's 190 gallons. At the time, most German tanks were rationed to about 15 litres per day per tank. So if these tanks didn't get through to their objective, they would simply grind to a halt. That objective is the town of Spa on the Belgian border. Spa was where quantities of fuel were stored literally on the sides of the road. And one element of the German recon forces was dangerously close to finding this massive fuel depot when a US Army captain with some Belgian soldiers make the decision to dig a trench in the middle of the road, pour fuel into it, and set it on fire. And this German recon element sees that, turns around, and withdraws. They were painfully close to finding enough fuel that would have gotten them all the way to Antwerp. By now, the Germans are running out of time, as well as fuel. As the skies clear above the bulge, Allied fighter bombers begin harrying the panzer columns. And General Patton launches a counterattack. By the end of the campaign, Hitler has lost 98,024 men around 700 armoured vehicles and 1,600 combat aircraft for absolutely no gain at all. It is a disaster for the Germans in more ways than one. There are German generals that don't want this attack because the troops could have been put to really good use trying to hold off the Soviets approaching Berlin. They're screaming for those troops, but they don't get them because Hitler has this grand ambition of this sudden attack through the Ardennes that will recapture Antwerp. The only concrete thing that was achieved was to slow the Allies down. So the ultimate result of the Battle of the Bulge, well, you could say it was to expose enormous swathes of Germany to conquest by the Red Army. On the 30th of January, 1945, the spearhead of the Soviet Red Army, commanded by Marshal Georgi Zhukov, reaches the river Oder, just 44 miles from Berlin. It is the culmination of a victorious charge into German territory. Yet still, the Germans fight on. From 1943 onwards, German propaganda hammered out the same themes all the time. And the Allies will take revenge, the Jews will take revenge, the Bolshevik menace is coming, and this will be the end of Germany. Now, some Germans did believe that, of course, and they, they carried on fighting for that to the end. Where the Red Army was concerned, the propaganda wasn't entirely exaggerating. The Soviets inflicted enormous uh, violence against the German population. The evidence is pretty overwhelming of lots of reprisals and of looting. It's pure and simply revenge. The Germans have treated the Russians with such brutality. But there's also a sense that the Russians are arriving in Germany and they're seeing a standard of living that they don't recognize. The average German peasant lives so much better than his Russian equivalent. And they're uh, staggered by this. Why are they even invading us when they have all this already? And so that fuels a kind of anger that snowballs into a, a brutal mode of behavior. Those who paid most were women. Millions of German women were raped by the waves of Russians that were coming through. Many killed themselves rather than falling into the hands of the Russians or having been mistreated by the Russians. It was a very real revenge. Across all fronts, at least 400,000 German soldiers died in the last five months of the war, when anything but defeat was hopeless. But some Nazis had darker reasons to fight on than their compatriots. Some had terrible secrets to hide. On the 27th of January, 1945, uh, a unit of the Red Army's 107th Rifle Division came upon a, a, a camp hidden in a forest about 30 miles west of Krakow. This camp was abandoned. Some of the buildings were destroyed, but 8,000 emaciated people remained in it who were able to tell this unit, what they had stumbled upon. Auschwitz. Auschwitz-Birkenau has become a symbol of the terrible crimes perpetrated by the Nazis in the Holocaust and a byword for horror. 
But it wasn't the only camp uncovered by the Russian advance. The Soviets were the first to encounter death camps, seeing Majdanek already in the summer of 44. And this was the first, really, and only occasion on which uh, a Nazi crematorium unit, including the gas chambers, had been discovered pretty much functioning. The Nazis had been pushed back so fast, they simply hadn't had time to destroy the evidence before they fled. At Auschwitz, they tried to cover their tracks. They'd taken people off on these horrific marches through the snowy countryside, going westwards, and they just left the sick and the dying who weren't fit to walk. Of the 714,000 concentration camp prisoners held by the Reich in January 1945, almost half were dead by the end of May, as the Nazis indulged in one last great orgy of killing. When the Soviets were discovered Auschwitz, it shot them in the scale and in the industrial design of this kind of killing. The British and Americans were very, very skeptical. They thought that the Soviets were lying about this. And so when the British and Americans discovered Bergen-Belsen, uh, Dachau, Buchenwald, and so forth, one of the sentiments expressed was, it turns out the Russians were telling the truth about all of this. Now, the reckoning was coming. On Monday the 16th of April, 1945, the massed batteries of Marshal Zhukov's first Belarusian front unleashed 1,236,000 shells against the dug-in positions of the German 9th Army defending Berlin. It took 2,450 freight cars to carry the shells that were expended in the first day, a single day, of attacking Berlin. The Soviets followed this up with an assault by 2.5 million troops, 6,250 tanks, 41,000 artillery, and 7,500 aircraft on two main fronts. Against them were ranged around 760,000 Germans with 1,500 armored vehicles and 9,000 artillery. In actual fact, only about 85,000 Soldiers are protecting the city itself. Half of them are, are old men, young boys. Half of them are die-hard Nazis, some of them foreign SS troops. The rest of the German army was actually trying to fall back from Berlin and head west to surrender to the Western Allies. But it's no wonder then that Zhukov's assault only takes a week until he's parked right outside the Reichstag, right in the heart of Berlin. On the 30th of April, 1945, two days after Benito Mussolini had been shot and hung in Italy, Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun committed suicide in the Führer bunker. That same day, Zhukov's forces stormed the Reichstag, just 400 yards from Hitler's hiding place, and raised the Soviet flag over it. The German army officially surrendered nine days later. The battle for Berlin cost the Soviets 352,425 casualties, of which 78,291 were killed. But that was a drop in the ocean compared to their total losses throughout the Second World War. The Soviet Union mobilized about 34.5 million people in World War II, almost 11.5 million soldiers died. By comparison, the Germans lost half that many soldiers. The British and the Americans combined lost less than a tenth of what the Soviets had to endure. But it's really when you add the, the civilian casualties into the mix of the true cost of the war to the Russian strikes home. It, it, it's virtually impossible to put a figure uh, on the number of civilians who were starved or shot or simply worked to death by the Nazis after Operation Barbarossa. But the generally accepted estimate is around 16 million, which means that something like 27 million Russians died in what Stalin dubbed the Great Patriotic War. When you compare that with the 50 to 60 million people who are estimated to have died overall during the war, you realize that the Russians alone lost half the total number of people who died during the Second World War.
But for the Russians, as well as for the Americans, Chinese and Japanese, the war isn't over yet. The war in Europe may be won, but the fight back in the Pacific has only just begun. In April 1944, the Imperial Japanese Army mounts the largest operation it will ever undertake during the Second World War. But it's not targeted at the Americans, it's targeted at China. We tend to forget that the Second World War actually started in China in 1937, and it's continued unabated ever since. 510,000 troops on the Chinese mainland launch Operation Ichigo, an ambitious thrust into the heart of Chinese nationalist territory. Operation Ichigo was a Japanese plan to strike at American airfields that were beginning to bomb the Japanese home islands. The Japanese pushed forward, finally conquering large swathes of central China that simply hadn't fallen to the Japanese in the previous six or seven years. As the Kuomintang of Chiang Kai-shek collapses, the Japanese victory looks overwhelming. The success of Ichigo ends up being a bit of a mirage because this inadvertently sets the stage for bombing operations against the Japanese home islands. American bombers are now within striking range of the Japanese mainland. And they exploit this with a vengeance. The US 21st Bomber Command is led by a man called General Curtis LeMay. Now he draws up this big list of Japanese urban and industrial targets and he starts doing so in February 1945. A series of punishing aerial attacks start off small and then begin getting larger and larger and larger. In that first month, his planes conduct 2,700 sorties against Tokyo and Yokohama alone. The infamous Great Raid on Tokyo actually kills 83,000 people and renders a further one and a half million people homeless. This campaign is going to flatten 40% of buildings in 66 Japanese cities and displace 8 million people. As unfortunate as that is, that is exactly the type of success that LeMay is looking for. Yet despite the pounding their citizens are taking, the die-hard militarists in control of the Japanese government are determined to fight on. Having won their empire, they don't want to give it up. There's a cold, hard calculus associated with what compels the Japanese to continue fighting on in the, in the face of these bombing raids, and that is the belief that if they demonstrate to the United States that a potential invasion is going to be so costly. The United States will have to back down from the idea of unconditional surrender. Faced with the obdurate refusal of Japan to admit that it's beaten, the American high command adopts the strategy known as island hopping. All that matters is grabbing every Japanese held island en route to the Japanese mainland. And one island that has to be taken is the ash-covered volcanic atoll of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is only about a third the size of Manhattan. But it's an important island because it is exactly halfway between the three air bases in the Mariana Islands and Tokyo. This puts it right under the flight path of American bombers on their way to bomb Japan. It provides airfields from which Japanese aircraft can intercept the B-29 700 miles before Tokyo. They've got to take out the airfields on Iwo Jima. Easier said than done. Iwo Jima was just one big beehive, a warren of fighting positions. They were so well dug in that even a 79-day aerial and naval bombardment hardly does any damage at all. This island imposes unspeakable casualties. American GIs have to winkle out the defenders with flamethrowers and grenades at murderously close quarters. The fighting on Iwo Jima was so hellish that the Marines start to call every valley, every ridge, names like Meat Grinder, Death Ridge, Blood Valley. And then, once it looks like maybe the enemy has been suppressed, the army sets up the fighter base, only then to have 300 Japanese appear out of caves and conduct a bonsai charge into an area where ground crewmen are living. The taking of Iwo Jima takes 45 days and costs the US Marines 6,821 dead and over 18,000 wounded. <laughs> 
This is the only time an American fighting force sustains more casualties than there are defenders. The Japanese lose over 21,000 people on that island. The island hopping campaign is going to be nothing but a nasty street fight from start to finish. But Iwo Jima is merely the warm-up to the desperate struggle for the island of Okinawa, which begins five days later. It's important to the Americans because it is basically a gateway to the home islands. If they can take Okinawa, they've therefore got a post that's just 350 miles from the Japanese mainland. On Sunday the 1st of April 1945, more than 1,200 US vessels escort 60,000 Marines onto the landing beaches as the prelude to an invasion of over 170,000 men. They expected a rain of steel, and instead the landing craft hit the beach, Marines and soldiers exit them, and it's silence. They're completely unopposed, and it's not until they start going into the center of the island that they start to realize what's lying in store for them. It takes the Marines 82 days to fight their way across the ferociously defended ridges of Okinawa. By the time that was over, some 7,000 Marines had been killed, and around 32 to 37,000 had been wounded. Japanese 32nd Army on the island sustained over 100,000 killed in action. There are barely 7,000 prisoners taken on Okinawa. And that's not even considering the loss of civilian life, which was staggering, believed to be over 100,000. So Okinawa is a place where in ground combat, almost a quarter of a million lives were lost. And off the coast of Okinawa, a macabre death ritual is being carried out will drive home just how costly the invasion of Japan will be to the Americans. One of the most unnerving experiences that American sailors had to face was the suicidal missions carried out by Japanese kamikaze pilots against American shipping. Kamikaze refers to the divine wind which sank the fleet of the great Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan in the 13th century. It's imbued with Japanese heroism and folklore and myth given to these young pilots. In carrying out a suicide attack, they were honored forever for sacrificing their lives uh, to perpetuate the Japanese empire. But behind all the ritual and self-sacrifice, lay cold, hard, numerical reality. The attrition rate for the Japanese pilots by this time in the war was approaching 96%. What they're left with are inexperienced pilots and a dramatic fuel shortage. So they can't even train the pilots that they have. All a kamikaze pilot has to do is get his plane up in the air, point it at a conning tower, and crash into it. It was very effective. During the three months of the Okinawa campaign, 1,465 kamikaze attacks sink 29 ships and damage 120 others, killing and wounding 9,083 U.S. naval personnel. Add the losses offshore to the losses among the Army and Marine divisions fighting onshore. You have over 10,000 killed. When you consider the killed, wounded, and missing, the number increases to 53,000 add 36,000 cases of combat fatigue, the number pushes toward 90,000. And all of that for an island that's 90 miles long from top to bottom and eight miles wide. So when the Joint Chiefs of Staff commission a kind of casualty estimate for what it's gonna cost them to invade the Japanese homeland, the number comes out at 350,000 men they have to confront some uncomfortable realities. You only have to look at what the Japanese were doing with their Unit 731. Now that was developing biological weapons. Japanese school students are being trained for suicide tactics. Then you add to that, a large number of one-way suicide boats were discovered. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had to confront one basic question, and it was, is it worth it? There's got to be another way. In August, they find one. On the morning of August 6, 1945, people in Hiroshima look up to see three B-29s above the city. 
the inhabitants of Hiroshima actually thought they were immune from bombing because Hiroshima had been spared the onslaught of the B-29 bombing campaign. The awful truth is that General Curtis LeMay was ordered to set aside three Japanese cities for special treatment. Uh, but now the time has come for the people of Hiroshima to experience bombing. The one single atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima by the Enola Gay flattens half the city and immediately incinerates more than 40,000 people. And more civilians will die in the months that follow. People begin to die of this new thing, radiation poisoning. And as time goes by, it elevates the total loss of life at Hiroshima and brings that number all the way up to about 140,000. But the Japanese fail to surrender. So three days later, the US drops Fat Man on Nagasaki, killing almost 30,000 instantly and condemning more than 73,000 to a lingering death. hours of the same day, almost two million Soviet troops, supported by 5,500 tanks, surge into Manchuria and overwhelm the Japanese garrison there. Emperor Hirohito insisted then that his civilian representatives open up communications with the government of the United States toward a negotiated settlement. Hirohito's inclinations when he comes to the throne in the 1920s, of course, is to be a pacifist and internationalist and a democrat and so on. And he finds himself hostage increasingly to a militarized society which is engaging in, in violent imperial conquest. And he never really manages to square that circle until finally at the very end of the war, when the threat of Russian invasion, starvation, the atomic bomb puts him in a position where he can say to the military, well, you were wrong all along and I was right, you know, it's time to end the war. Now, he's going to make a radio broadcast on the 14th of August that's going to announce Japan's surrender. Even now, the die-hard militarists refuse to accept defeat. You still got this hardcore clique of militaristic officers who try to get into the Imperial Palace, locate the recording that's going to announce the surrender and destroy it. Their belief is that the Emperor's wisdom has been tarnished by defeatists people who did not believe that victory was still possible, because to them, it still was. The emperor and his chamberlain actually have to hide from these rebels. There was even gunplay on the grounds of the imperial palace as the mutineers sought to find the discs upon which the imperial rescript was recorded. And it's not until troops loyal to the emperor actually manage to fight off the rebels, and the rebels end up committing suicide, that actually the broadcast is finally safe. Whether the Emperor could have prevailed over these fanatical hawks without the impetus of the atom bomb is something historians still argue over today. If I'd been in the shoes of the American leadership in 1945, would I have dropped the atom bombs? And I'm afraid my answer to that is probably yes. The Japanese were still fighting. The idea that they were ready to surrender, um, I don't buy that at all. This hardcore clique in the Japanese high command still want to fight on. It was Nagasaki that really is what got through to the emperor and made him intervene. From the American perspective, the atomic bomb was dropped because they really did think they might bring the water in quickly and save lots of American lives. But I think they were also impelled very much by a kind of technological imperative that they were desperate to see if it worked. Very few people in 1945 understood the unspeakable shocking horror of atomic weapons. They hadn't been demonstrated. And for Roosevelt's successor, President Truman, the atom bomb must have seemed like a perfect solution. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold. Do you remember the firebombing by conventional bombs that killed far more Japanese than did Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And I'm afraid it is true of all wars that people will do things when 
They are sick of the killing and sick of the dying and they want it to be over and the Japanese refuse to quit. To me, it doesn't look like an issue of atomic weapons versus conventional weapons. It looks to me like an issue of whether or not it's right to bomb civilians at all. At the start of September 1945, General Douglas MacArthur accepts the Japanese surrender on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The Second World War is officially over. Even before the dust begins to settle, the Western Allies are faced with two problems to solve. One is how they're going to deal with the Russians. The other is what to do about the Nazis. In July 1945, two months before the Japanese surrender, the Allied leaders Churchill, Truman and Stalin meet at Potsdam, Germany, to hammer out the post-war settlement of Europe. Germany is divided into four occupation zones. In November, the Allies agree to try the Nazis for crimes against humanity at a military tribunal in Nuremberg. But the number they can put on trial is severely limited. The International Military Tribunal only puts in the dock the number that can sit on the bench, and they figured out that there was room for 24. Even before the trials begin, one of the 24 was deemed mentally unfit, and another committed suicide. The classic defence trotted out by many of the senior Nazis at Nuremberg was one of only following orders. But Allied intelligence had proof that the atrocities were widely known in Nazi military circles. Trent Park is a stately home in North London, and during the Second World War, the British intelligence held Hitler's captured generals, and they lived a life of relative luxury, but of course what they didn't realise was that everything in the house was bugged. From the transcripts, we can see that the Wehrmacht, the German army, was complicit in war crimes, that it was involved in the killing machine and in the Holocaust. Other criminals, of course, uh, such as Goering, were utterly unapologetic about what they'd done. Then you had people like Albert Speer, who decided the best way to save his life was to apologise for it. He, he distanced himself very much from Hitler. Of the 22 Nazis who stood trial at Nuremberg, three were acquitted, seven were imprisoned, and the other 12 were sentenced to death. Though Nuremberg was not the only trial of Nazi perpetrators, only a handful actually paid for their crimes. Historians reckon that between 200,000 and 800,000 people were involved in murdering Jews. Of those, 99% of people who actually killed Jews were never brought to court. In West Germany, somewhere between 106,000 and 140,000 people were investigated, and only 164 people in West Germany were actually found guilty of murder. 164 people for six million plus murders, that is a quite extraordinary figure. If you look at overall numbers, including the trials carried out by the East Germans and the Austrians, again, the outcome is absolutely pathetic in terms of sheer numbers. The reason for such leniency was political. The biggest reason was the switch from the war to the Cold War. So at that point, chasing communists became a higher priority. Because as the Second World War came to an end, the biggest danger to democracy appeared to be the Western power's erstwhile ally, Joseph Stalin. Stalin's a big winner from the Second World War. He's got a lot more territory in 1945 than he ever did in 1939. One of the tragic dimensions of World War II is the fact that it seems to vindicate Stalin personally. Yes, it's cost him millions of lives, but he's now also got a kind of narrative attached to his personality. He presents it afterwards as his own personal victory. But the Soviet command economy was not geared to sustain the empire that Stalin and his successors created off the back of the Second World War. You could say the Soviet bloc became, on the face of it, very strong, but actually it got far too big, far too unwieldy, and within really quite a short time, the whole thing collapsed again. As the Cold War heated up, the Soviets found it increasingly expensive to compete with the other great winner of World War II. The United States was 
overwhelmingly the biggest winner. It came out of the war incomparably richer as well as more powerful than it had been at the outset. The United States then navigates into the post-war time period as really a beacon of economic strength and security. Whereas almost every other belligerent was both physically ruined um, and also um, financially bankrupt. The Second World War cost the nations of Europe an estimated 958 billion US dollars and brought France, Britain and Germany to their knees. As the Iron Curtain of Communism began to sweep over Eastern Europe, General Marshall, ex-US Chief of Staff from World War II, realized that something had to be done. It wasn't enough for America to be strong. Europe had to be stable as well, and the best way for Europe to be stable was for its economies to thrive. Marshall advocates a generous program that shares economic wealth with the countries that were affected by the Second World War to include the former Nazi Germany. He was smart enough to recognize that restricting Germany's economy would probably mean that we would repeat the cycle that was created by the Versailles Treaty at the end of the First World War. Under the Marshall Plan, 16 European nations received a total of 13 billion US dollars in financial aid between 1948 and 1951. West Germany received $1.4 billion, France almost $2.3 billion. But by far the biggest recipient of US aid was Great Britain. There's also a vital strategic reason for the Marshall Plan, to make sure that Europe is prosperous enough in order to be able to arm herself as a bulwark against any form of encroaching Soviet Union. But Marshall aid wasn't the only legacy of the Second World War. Some admirable institutions emerged, certainly the United Nations, later NATO, and of course the EU, because of the determination to bind together France and Germany in such a fashion that they would never think of going to war again. In 1950, you had the European coal and steel community coming into play. Now that's a block of six nations there to trade in those essential materials. You have France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, the six European nations most physically affected by the war. And you can see by incremental steps, these countries are deliberately coming closer together. So the kind of disaster that took place with the First World War and the Second World War couldn't happen again. If you can create this kind of trading block or almost this idea of a single state, you can't therefore have a war because you no longer see each other as separate countries, you see each other as kind of brothers and sisters. And that makes a lot of sense to the French, to the Germans, to the Dutch. These nations experienced what it was to have foreign soldiers' boots marching up and down their lanes, to have their people subject to, to, to control by foreign nations. Britain never experienced that. So perhaps it's not surprising that Britain feels it's never lost its sovereignty, it's damn well not gonna lose its sovereignty now. The economic boom that followed the post-war slump created a new prosperity that particularly benefited the war's biggest losers. Germany would not count itself as a big winner in 1945, but it certainly looks like it came out of it in the best possible way. One of the huge ironies of the Second World War was that if Germany had not gone to war, nothing could have prevented Germany from dominating Europe within 20 years by entirely peaceful economic and industrial means. Look at Germany today. Germany is a thriving uh, representative democracy with a strong economy. Japan also benefited from the post-war settlement. But there was another winner from the Second World War, and that was China's Mao Zedong. It's said that when the Japanese Prime Minister visited Mao in Beijing in 1972 and apologized for the Japanese invasion of China back in the 30s, Mao supposedly said to him, well, actually, you don't need to apologize because if you hadn't done that, the Chinese Communist Party would never have come to power. Victory of the Japanese opened the way for uh, Mao and the Chinese Communist Movement to confront Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists effectively and to win the civil war four years later. In 2019, as we commemorate the 80th anniversary of the start of the Second World War, the forces that drove it into being seem to be raising their ugly heads once again.
One of the reasons for fighting the Second World War was to free the world of tyranny from suppression and order to foster liberalism, democracy and all these big ideas. Today there's an almost near collapse of trust in the liberal elites and one's fear that all sorts of very illiberal elites um, may once again be ascendant is something I think we should be very frightened of. It's always easy to look at the past and make distinctions, say, no, no, it was different then, we've, we've moved on. Well, believe me, the world really hasn't changed all that much. We need to be aware in the 21st century that the shadow of these wars hangs over us and that we don't want to repeat them. But that's something we have to educate people all the time into understanding what happened in the Second World War and making sure it never happens again. Because if the world does go to war again, then the numbers are going to be much bigger than the World War II numbers. <laughs>